You're welcome. <laughs> it's such a simple phrase. We say it all the time. Thank you. You're welcome. The first time I thought about what it actually meant was in junior high. You are welcome. It felt kind of funny. That was the moment in my childhood where I actually felt the least welcome. I had never fit in, but middle school makes it even worse, I think. I had just changed schools and I felt distinctively unwelcome. To the point where I was spending uh, recesses in the sixth grade, hiding in bathroom stalls, reading Nancy Drew novels with my feet perched on the toilet paper holder so I wouldn't get caught and forced to go outside and play with my tormentors. By seventh grade, I'd actually taken to eating lunch in the bathroom stalls as well. It felt like an upgrade from the teacher's table, more privacy, plus you can wash your hands anytime you want. By eighth grade, I had stopped eating lunch altogether. I'd actually stopped eating much of anything at that point. I just wanted to disappear, which is a kind of audacious goal when you think about it, given that I'm six feet tall and a redhead and at that point had not developed an inside voice. Nonetheless, middle school is a rough moment, but it's sort of a rite of passage for everyone to feel unwelcome, I think. If you fit in in middle school, you have nothing to aspire to, right? You don't want the best moments of your life to be prom and homecoming. I knew that there would be a place where I would fit in and people who would welcome my particular brand of misfit. And I found it for the first time in the fall of my junior year. I had convinced my grandmother to send me to Interlochen Arts Academy, which is boarding school in northern Michigan for the performing and visual arts. And it was the first time that I found kids who were like me, who were sincere and earnest and passionate and disciplined, who knew that they would be somebody someday and do something amazing. Whether it was perform on Broadway stages or play cello for the New York Philharmonic, or my dream to train as an astronaut while running for president and sing at Carnegie Hall all at the same time. <laughs> but it was the first time that I felt like I belonged, that I felt like I was wanted, and that I was worth something. And because of this, my passion became creating spaces and building products that made other people feel welcome too. My first company, Quincy Apparel, we designed, manufactured, and retailed professional apparel for young women. Because when you feel confident and comfortable and authentic at work, it's powerful. You may not know this, but shopping for a suit as a woman, it's a particularly disheartening endeavor. Suits are an entire category of clothing that were designed for men's bodies. <laughs> And then at some point in the 80s, we collectively decided that we would put women's bodies with our, our curves and our variety of shapes into these garments as well. I'm not really sure why we decided this, but you know, in tech we get to opt out of this, but there are entire industries where they expect you to wear a suit every day. Now, I have always struggled to find clothes. I'm super tall and I have swimmer shoulders and I have runner calves and clothes are just not designed for my body type. But it turns out a lot of other women have this problem too. Because the sizing standard that was created for patterns was based off of data collected in the 1940s, when an average woman was five foot two with a B-cup bra size and an hourglass shape. And 75 years later, that's just not what women look like anymore. And so to, to fit into these garments, it's an act of feeling like a misfit. We wanted to fix that. Because when you feel calm and confident in your clothes, you can stand tall and speak a little louder and raise your hand a little better and lean in. It's like putting on a superhero cape. And at Quincy, we believe that everyone should get to feel like a superhero. Now, I spent a lot of my time in theater. And in that, I spent a lot of time in costumes, in and around them. And I learned that half of getting into character is just putting on the right costume. Now you might think that a story about a fashion tech company has little to do with your life. But I would disagree. Because understanding the implicit assumptions and biases in how our products and communities are made helps us make better design choices to make them more inclusive. I've been in tech for five years now. And over that time, I have been astonished at the the pace that we have made this community more inclusive, that it's no longer acceptable to have conferences that are 100% male speakers, 
or lists of people to watch that are all white men. The female founders are getting funded more often and female investors are getting in the game even if they have to step up and raise their own fund to do it. We're making progress, but we're not there yet. The pipeline is still leaky because there are women who are joining this community as product managers and engineers and founders and marketers and they're doing their best and they're working their butts off to try to make their way up the ladder. But the friction and the lack of support, it can add up over time. And for many of them, they wake up one morning and they say, you know what, enough is enough. Why am I fighting so hard to stay a part of a community that doesn't want me? We still have work to do. But for me, I saw an opportunity at the beginning of the pipeline. Because I spend most of my time trying to explain to my friends and colleagues alike why it's not inconsistent that I'm both a math nerd and a theater geek. Why I both love singing opera and writing code. Because the public perception is that girls don't like STEM. And that's just not true. A 2012 report from the Girl Scouts of America showed that 74% of high school girls are interested in STEM subjects and careers. The same proportion as for boys. The difference is that girls also like humanities and social studies and the arts and sports in equal measure. And so girls who like STEM don't look like boys who like STEM. If you're trying to pattern match against boy coders and boy gamers, girls are not going to get through that filter. So I founded Bridge Up STEM, based up at the American Museum of Natural History, so that we can meet girls where they already are, where their interests already lie. We teach computer science through the lens of subjects they're already interested in, like DNA and dinosaurs. And we expose them to role models across the STEM pipeline. Because you can't be what you can't see. Because feeling welcome is a powerful thing. And because the world can use more superheroes. Thank you.